I have no idea of what Miss Pilkington looks like. It was her example that left a lasting impression on me. My friends, on today's journey in the making, I have chosen personal is universal as my theme. In the story that I'm about to tell you, I will illustrate what really woke me up to the beauty of a personal story. By sharing our personal stories, we share experiences, which then puts our personal journey in a wider universal perspective. In June 1998, I got into some serious trouble. I had to make sudden and drastic adjustments to my lifestyle. I had been accused by the Crown Prosecution in England of being the ringleader of an international drug smuggling operation. And I was being held in Wormwood Scrubs Prison in London. Now, although the allegations were rather inflated, they were not altogether false. As prisoner AV9740, on C-Wing cell 301, life was hell. I was locked up for 23 hours a day in a small, decrepit cell with a guy who was going through an emotional meltdown. He was a political refugee from Afghanistan, and he had been accused of rape. So even although my situation seemed dire, his seemed infinitely worse. To give you an idea of what conditions were like, I brought along a newspaper clipping, uh, which some friends in London kept for me. As you can see, uh, this was published in the Guardian newspaper in June 1999, so one year after my arrest. And I'll just read a, a couple of things from it. So 25 Scrubs officers face brutality charges. Police investigating allegations of the systematic beating of inmates at Wormwood Scrubs Jail are to charge 25 prison officers, Scotland Yard said last night. The West London Jail, whose name is one of the most famous and notorious in Britain. Behind the proud facade lies a decaying Victorian jail whose horrific conditions stem from a failure to modernize. Not exactly a picnic. Also, there was evidence to show that I had been involved in smuggling 10 kilograms of marijuana from South Africa to London. I was in an intolerable position and knew not what to do or which way to turn. The only option left for me was to pray. I prayed. Interestingly enough, in times when I'm in the most pain or the most discomfort, my prayers are the most fervent and sincere ever. But in this case, even those prayers seem to be useless. My situation seemed absolutely hopeless. I really didn't believe that I could change it by just praying. So I decided to muster up support. I called in the heavyweights. I wrote to a prayer circle and I asked them to pray for me. Now, what I, my understanding of prayer is the art of having or being that which is asked for and then accepting whatever comes along. 
I wanted to be in better spirits. Actually, I wanted to be on a terrace sitting with friends overlooking the ocean. But, of course, somehow I knew this was not a realistic wish. Nevertheless, I wanted the courage to do the right thing. Would I plead guilty, which would then mean staying in prison, or not guilty, which would mean telling a pack of lies and trying to squirm my way out of it. Neither choice seemed appealing to me. I was beside myself with anxiety. My brother from Sydney was in London at the time with his wife celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary, and we had plans to meet up. However, he was now visiting me in prison and running around getting testimonials and doing his best to raise the 35,000 pounds which was required to get me out on bail. He was not very happy. Then an envelope arrived. And inside the envelope was a handwritten letter and notes on how to do linking with the prayer circle. Now, the handwritten letter was helpful, generous, and supportive, and signed by Miss Pilkington. Now, Miss Pilkington was a total stranger to me, and this letter, and her many subsequent letters, were very supportive and, and helpful to me. All that was asked of me was to do the linking and keep in touch. So once a week, at a specified time, I linked with a group of anonymous volunteers who gave their time and effort on my behalf. An empowering thought. And my new cellmate, Simon, joined in. In my next letter to Miss Pilkington, I did not want to be telling her that I had committed suicide. No, I wanted to tell her that I had been doing the linking and things were going much better. Here was somebody rooting for me without judgment and without expecting anything in return. Now, linking is getting quiet and having a meeting in the mind with this group of people for a particular purpose. And of course, the purpose and the intention was mine. Clarity came to my dilemma. It became abundantly clear to me that I had been stupid enough, stupid enough to get caught and that the simple and right thing to do would be to face the consequences of my actions. I decided then that I would plead guilty. Perhaps one of the most difficult decisions I had ever made. Nonetheless, having made that decision gave me a sense of liberation. I now felt free to tell the truth. I knew for sure that I would be staying in prison for quite some time, and now I could get down to serving my sentence and learning how to deal with it. Any time spent on remand would count towards my sentence. I had to remind myself that my life was happening now. It wasn't on hold and then would resume uh, when, I had been, when I would be released. Two months later, when my trial came up, I got a two-year sentence and ended up spending nine months and then was released with an electronic tag. 
And during my time as house arrest, I was staying with a family, and I have to admit, they were guilty of entrusting their children to an ex-con. Part of my conditions were that I had to stay in from seven at night till seven in the morning, seven days a week, an ideal babysit. And they took full advantage. They partied. But that's another story. I had been inspired by Miss Pilkington's letter. And I decided I would help other inmates, especially non-English speaking inmates, with their letters, applications for bail, requests for medical assistance, and even romantic letters. Invariably, I was given tobacco as a token of appreciation. Now, as you may know, tobacco is the currency in prison, so I became relatively wealthy. Outwardly, things had not changed, but inwardly, I had now found a sense of purpose and accomplishment. A circle of people working for the benefit of others creates a living bridge for healing to occur. It is not about promoting a religion or dogma, but it is about facilitating a flow of support and understanding. As Mother Teresa said, it is not a miracle that we do this work, but that we are happy to do it. It is now 15 years on since I first received that letter from Miss Pilkington. And since then, in 2004, I co-founded and facilitated a prayer circle. Being the front man, I received all the requests and wrote all the replies. And doing that work uh, taught me that listening and understanding have, without further interference by themselves have a healing quality of their own. Then one day, I got a letter from somebody in prison asking for help. I had to sign on to a special website to send and receive emails. But as I wrote a reply... Memories came flooding back of my experience in prison. And it was then it struck me that I had a story to tell, a story of how I found a sense of well-being under even the most adverse conditions. And yet, I had been keeping the story a secret. I was ashamed of what I had done. We corresponded until her release, whereupon I received an email from her, which I printed out and I would like to now share with you. Thank you for your thoughts and help. Thank you for your influence, words of support and prayers. There have been times in recent years where I just feel at a loss. I really appreciate your input and great support in my life. I don't know where I would be without you and your help. Thank you. Now, I really have Miss Pilkington to thank for having set the example. Some of my most fondest memories are of people that I have never even met. And to conclude when I knew that I would be telling this story to you today, I wrote to the Seekers Trust prayer circle inquiring about Miss Pilkington and asking permission if I may talk about her in my story. And I received a handwritten letter back. Thank you so very much for your letter. Sadly, Miss Pilkington died two years ago 
aged 97. So although I have no idea what Miss Pilkington looks like, and probably never will, the memory of her example is very much alive. Amen.